Hello everybody, thank you for joining me for another one-man review. Today I'm going to do a quick overview of a book by Yoshiharu Suge, Red Flowers. It's the new collection of his work from Drawn and Quarterly. It's a follow-up to a book. I think it was the second book that me and Sean did on this channel. Um, Sean introduced me to Suge, so I'm assuming we're going to come back to this book together, but just with what I know we've got going on, it's probably going to be a while, so I, I wanted to get this out since it just came out. But Sean introduced me to Suge with The Swamp. The Swamp was presented this way as well, and it felt like an artist finding his feet. This seems to be like now he's really found his voice as an artist, and these are some really powerful stories. I don't know if these are considered the best stories he did, or if there's going to be a number of these releases from Drawn and Quarterly showing him increasing in his power as an artist, but they're really good stories. Um, it's a really impressive collection of work especially considering that the stories were all done in 1967 and 1968 so they feel like contemporary lit comic short stories of the sort that you would get from drawn quarterly and fanographic artists say like adrian tomine that was something that really took caught me off guard when we were reading the swamp with a lot of the stories and continues to really wow me here if this is what was going on in the underground in Japan in the late 60s and early 70s compared to what was going on in the underground like here and in the UK, uh, you win Japan for making comics adult and literate and uh, mature, not just in like a sexual or graphic violence sense, but in terms of having really mature emotional content. This is really really impressive work and I, I could see why this is so important and it's sad that it's taken it this long to be published over here um so just a, a quick summary of most of the stories and then shout out to a couple images that i really like the wake uh the first two stories seem really concerned with an irreverent look at death so this and they set up the travel there's a lot of like travelogue stuff in here i didn't read the essay in the back not really interested in that kind of stuff but by looking at the captions and on the photos, it seems like Suge himself really liked to travel and that some of the later work are more autobiographical. And one of the works speaks to that pretty strongly. So setting up this idea of people traveling and staying, like renting a location for the night. These hoodlums rent a room and they wind up being in a room with a dead man. And they say, well, that doesn't really bother us. And then some inappropriate, disrespectful shenanigans happen with the dead man. The second story in here, The Salamander, is uh, probably one of my favorite stories. It really, really sets up some horrific imagery. I imagine somebody like Junji Ito and some of the other contemporary horror artists that are really popular were looking at this story or stories like it for just the absolutely unsettling imagery. Um, it's just a salamander kind of describing its life. But this, first off, amazing composition right here. Uh, but there's a scene where a dead aborted baby or a fetus floats in and bumps into the salamander. And it's just absolutely unsettling, really unsettling work. But thematically feels resonant. I would have to go back and compare the dates if these happened one after the other, maybe. March and May. Yeah, so those two... I guess this book is pretty sequential with a jump here. So these must be the order that they come out in. Those two feel very related to me. Um, the Lee family takes a turn. It's still creepy, but it takes a turn into more comedy and less horror. This guy has his kind of shanty house uh, out in the woods, and a, a family comes and kind of butts their way into his life and just moves in with him without I mean kind of with his permission but then they just stay uh so there's some good humor in that you start to get a sense of like his love for scenery I don't know that he's doing all the art on this I don't know if he has a background artist but to me the characters even though they're less realistic and the rendering style of the characters and the background feel very integrated in a way I'm not used to in manga, a lot of times there's pretty obvious, like like well, like when we looked at Mizuki, there's very rubbery, cartoony figures, and then these super detailed backgrounds. Um, this feels like, even though the level of detail changes, it feels like the same hand 
on them. So I'm thinking he's doing the art, but I'm not sure. And that shows up throughout, just his love for scenery. Um, the dog from Prayer Pass, not so into this story. Uh, it's cute. A guy meets a dog. The dog's cute. You know, that each one of these stories has not a twist ending, but like a little poetic bent on the story at the end. So they're all good in that way. Um, scenes from the Seaside. Really like this one. This really feels like a lot of books that I like right now, like the John McEwen type of stuff that's really just focused on atmosphere and ambience. I think a lot of his work also influ influenced Jiro Taniguchi, like The Walking Man, those type of healing stories that Taniguchi does that are really focused on place and atmosphere. Um, these have more narrative than that. But, oh, like this, absolutely my favorite two-page spread in the book, just in terms of composition all of the rhythm and negative space and silhouettes here. Just this huge silhouette, beautiful negative spaces, the scale shift between the tiny characters and the huge boat, and then the change between like the stark dark up here and the super densely detailed work down here. I just, that, that page just took my breath away. And then um, a big two-page spread. The rendering I don't think is as as well done in the sky and the image is a little bit muddier than the other ones but this seems like really ahead of its time for me too these huge two-page spreads that would be showing up this type of thing showing up in like the Ennio Asano work that we've looked at uh, a lot of other artists in Japan now that I appreciate that do these these big scale pullbacks um, yeah lovely lovely stuff red flowers the story that the book is named after. I didn't think this was one of the strongest stories. I found it to be one of the more baffling stories, which I guess is probably like in fashion. Uh, but it's a it's a guy, he's traveling, he wants to go fishing, he runs into a girl and a little boy and s sees some red flowers. And at some point, the the little boy sees the girl dropping red flowers out of her skirt. But then she's like complaining about cramps and gets sick. So there seems to be some weird connection to menstruation. She's having her period and it's like killing her. But also maybe just like she ate some of the flowers because they reference the fish eating the flowers and it's killing her. I don't know. It just seems kind of oddly about a girl having her period in a way that doesn't make sense to me. So uh, maybe the mystery of that's what makes that one the, the popular one that they named it after. But... I found it a middling story. Um, the incident in Nishibeta Village, excuse my pronunciation, this is where it really leans into, I think, travelogue. Um, I don't think it's autobiography yet, but maybe. And you can see he just becomes fascinated with showing these beautiful rural areas. So a fisher is out fly fishing in a town, and the townspeople tell him there's a man escaped from the loony bin and to be careful on that, that story plays out. Um, Chohachi Inn is another, in the series of travel log, a character stays at an inn that has some very famous pieces of plaster work in a town with an, with an artist that was well known for his plaster work. Um, and he kind of gets a crush on one of the girls there and is hunting down a nude photo of her, I think is the main gist of that story. Um, this one's kind of funny. The Fudomata Gorge is another travelogue story. Uh, here it becomes more, it seems properly autobiographical. And as soon as that happens, you get more of this like uh, journaling exposition, which I'm not so excited about, but he switches out of that. The main thing with these is this type of drawing here, these compositions. So he, he visits a lot of hot springs, and this one he's visiting a hot spring, and a monkey shows up, and there's some shenanigans. Um, I did really like this one, the Ondol Shack. It's another one where he's staying in a hot spring and a shack put on top of the spring to create like a sauna, and there's just some ruffian asshole kids show up and ruin his experience. But... Oh, this is another one of these compositions that just the use of white to flatten the image out, but also create space and atmosphere. I think that's absolutely fantastic. Just as a set of shapes, beautiful drawing. So, uh, yeah, I'll be, 
I'll be trying my best to to steal from his sense of composition. I don't know that I'll ever be that sophisticated. Um, Mr. Ben of the Hanyara Cave dips into, well, I'm doing autobiography. I guess I better do a story about an uh, artist struggling to come up with an idea. That's not all this one is. There's a lot more to it, but there's a scene in it, um, which I actually quite like because he, he's not really complaining about struggling. He just... He's talking about, oh, you know, maybe I, this guy's saying maybe you should stay here a while since you're an artist and work on your comics. He's like, I don't know. I, I don't really have a story to tell. I'm just enjoying traveling. And, and the guy's like, no, 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 stay, make a story. And, um, he, so he asks him, he says, well, you know, like, how do you come up with an idea for a story? And I like it because instead of complaining about it, he gives an example of like, okay, this is what I could do. Um, he doesn't do this story, but it's suggestive of what's going on. And, and he says, that rabbit's name, for example, I bet you didn't come up with that. That's the kind of name a child gives a pet, but you run this place alone so it doesn't add up. That's the kind of thing that makes a good comic. And then the guy gets mad and says, huh, sounds to me like comics these days have gotten quite rude. So that little bit of like, hey, there's something here that doesn't add up. And my ability to go in and, and fill in and make up a story about the missing details is like what I do. And it's obviously a bit like predatory on the guy's bad situation. He's, his kids either left him or died or something like that. And so it, it bums the guy out. Um, and, and it's a good example of like where stories come from. That's a lot of where my ideas for stories come from is I'll just see an interesting person in the world and like imagine filling in the details so i i found that one really interesting and, and i like that instead of complaining about not having a story he's showing about how he would generate one so it's a nice lesson to artists like this is what you do man like don't just get stuck um, and then this last one i can tell why they put it out of order because it seems more commercial it seems like he was trying to get paid <laughs> on this one and do an adventure story. It feels very like EC, Johnny Craig, Will Eisner kind of vibes in, in the art. It's a bunch of guys get stuck in a sand pit out in the desert. Um, I don't know, you can just see that, that vibe in it. There's an interesting part here where they pull one of my favorite formalist tricks where the character's talking and then he starts writing and then, then they're writing becomes the captions so i'm really interested with the ability for comics to put other documents in them because it's visual so we can just have like a page of text within the page of the comic and include literature that way and uh you know it's it's a fun it's not the most interesting version of it but i always make note of those things um this sequence here feels really EC to me, kind of Kurtzman or even an Eisner type of storytelling. The rendering style looks like Johnny Craig a little bit to me. Um, so I think that was probably more popular at the time and that's what he was doing. And then I had to make note of this particular panel here, just isolate that out and it is such a good composition. Again, that's one of the things that just Suge blows me away with is when he nails a composition uh, it's not that he ever has bad compositions, but man, does he do some ones that just slap me in the face off of the page. So really, really impressed with this book. I like The Swamp. I like this one way better. I feel like it's exactly what it was. The Swamp was him finding his voice, and this is him really reveling in his voice. I don't know if it continues to get better from here. If so, wow, like I can't wait to read it. It seems like... Um, Drawn and Quarterly is collecting these pretty chronologically, so I hope they keep going. I can't wait to read more, and I, I couldn't recommend this book more enough, and I hope that me and Sean do circle back, and once more people have had a chance to read it, and we can talk about the themes and stuff more deep, um, I, I would really, really like to do that. Thanks for following along. Take it away, Jack. What's the audience, folks? Smash that subscribe button, and the like button, and the bell, and then you get them.